So once again, I have the privilege of having a conversation for the Observing Japan Substack with a friend, a mentor, and really a, a genuinely insightful scholar and reporter. And that is Dan Snyder, currently a lecturer and scholar and writer based at Stanford, who has been a foreign correspondent in Tokyo, Moscow, uh, I believe in uh, Delhi, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, uh, and is currently uh, also doing some work on a book on his father's career. His father, Richard Snyder, shows up over and over again if you read uh, accounts of Asia policy during the uh, 60s and 70s. And of course, it's of great interest now in the aftermath of uh, Dr. Henry Kissinger's death. And so that is why we are speaking today. Uh, so thank you, Dan. Thank you for joining me. It's really, really looking forward to this conversation. Always a pleasure to talk to you, Tony. So Dan, I want to start just um, where I started with the uh, short note I wrote about um, Kissinger's death in Japan over the weekend, which is with the the brief statement that Prime Minister Kishida issued, which um, was a little puzzling, as you'll, you'll note that the Japanese government did not issue anything other than um, some brief remarks in a press conference when Secretary of State George Shultz passed away, which um, he certainly, I think, had a better record as far as the U.S.-Japan relationship was concerned. So um, what did you make of Kishida's statement? Well, it's a kind of a ritual uh, pay on to Henry Kissinger. And, you know, to some degree, uh, I'm not that surprised because he's such a huge figure in American foreign policy. So he gets that kind of attention and respect from everybody. Um, and, you know, the reference to Kissinger as the author of the Okinawa reversion is, you know, somewhat of a, 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 a you know, it's what people credit Kissinger with doing because he was the, sec the national security advisor that was there, or oversaw the, the process to some degree. But it's a, a somewhat mythical uh, idea, which I can talk about a little bit. But it's also an alternative to talking about what Japanese really remember Kissinger for, which is the Nixon shocks, uh, which were a tremendous, uh, I think, still reverberating moment in Japanese foreign policy and Japanese relations with the U.S. So the Japanese have been pressed for, you know, two decades not to uh, normalize relations with the People's Republic of China. Uh, Dulles did it, you know, uh, the Kennedy administration did it. Everybody pushed the Japanese uh, to stay in line, uh, even though they wanted very much to normalize relations with China. And uh, the, always the fear in Japan was that the Americans were going to turn around one day and leave them high and dry. And in fact, that's what they did. And Kissinger did it in typically uh, arrogant fashion, which is that he didn't tell the Japanese in any way until like moments, literally minutes before uh, the announcement was made of his secret visit to, uh, to Beijing. And it was a huge, just massive shock throughout the Japanese system. And it it literally led to the fall of uh, of a government. I mean, you could argue that Sato ceased being prime minister the moment uh, that happened. And it's really interesting to think about how quickly the Japanese turned around within weeks, months, uh, Tanaka rushes to uh, Beijing, normalizes relations with China. And actually, the it was the Japanese who made the formula on, the, on Taiwan, not the U.S., but they didn't do till much later. Uh, as, so it tells you that uh, it really, Kissinger in some sense opened up, he revealed really deep gaps between the United States and Japan that had been papered over for a long time. I think that's what Japanese re really remember Kissinger for, but then they, very polite people, they sort of give a little nod to uh, what he nominally supposedly did. Right. So it's, I mean, Kishida's statement really was as much um, about what it didn't say. And 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 really, when you think about um, Kissinger as a player in the U.S.-Japan relationship, and certainly in, in what you've sent me from your work in progress, uh, it is not a good look. And it is not a good look even when you look at Kissinger's own writings. I mean, this is not someone who uh, I think genuinely respected uh, Japan as a as an important power in its own right, as a uh, you know, and certainly at that point, as an economic power that was uh, finding its footing in the post-Cold or in the Cold War world and trying to figure out how to be uh, 
a power even without uh, you know, traditional military power, uh, that he, he clearly did not uh, value it all that much. And so I, I, I want to actually dig into what, what you talk about. And you, you write um, extensively about your father's role in, in the uh, process of Okinawa reversion and the debates within the U.S. government and then between the U.S. government and the Japanese government. And so before we even get to Kissinger, I mean, you you tell the story um, throughout the Johnson years as, you know, debates within the United States government, uh, sort of this collision between the reality that um, if the U.S. doesn't find a way to return um, Okinawa to Japanese control, that it's going to be a much bigger problem for the bilateral relationship as a whole because the polit the politics of the U.S. retaining this colony um, was going to get uglier. But at the same time, and this sounds very familiar to people who know the politics of the Okinawa issue now, that the U.S. military was not in any hurry to surrender control. And of course, you know, it had absolute control. It was fighting a war in Southeast Asia. And so you have these these two, uh, you know, move, the movable object, um, you know, meeting a, a <laughs> unstoppable force, I, I suppose, of, of Japanese domestic politics at the moment. So maybe talk a little bit about um from pre-Nixon administration to the, the backdrop um, to this data, debate about Okinawa that your father was was deeply involved. So, um, you know, my father was sort of ended up in this somewhat unique position of being the principal alliance manager in the State Department of the security relationship in particular. And it goes back to the mid 50s when he arrived. He was a Japanese language officer during the war during World War II. He fought in the Battle of Okinawa, as it happens, um, served in the occupation, was in the State Department of Intelligence for quite a while before he became a uh, foreign service officer. And he was the political military officer. He sort of ended up as a young uh, foreign service officer in the embassy in, in the mid-50s in Japan. That's when I first went to Japan as a little kid. And <clears throat> I always tell people I remember Japan when there were still 250,000 American troops stationed in Japan, which was the case when I arrived there as a small child. Um, that's a Japan that probably nobody remembers anymore. Um, so the the he ended up actually being the, uh, through his relationship, particularly with Ambassador MacArthur, the nephew of General MacArthur, um, he, being the drafter of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, uh, the revision of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, along with another young Japanese officer who also was rising through the same process by the name of Togo Fumihiko, who was the adopted son of Togo Shigenori, the wartime Japanese foreign minister. Uh, and the two men really created this bond. And I think to some degree was rooted in both of their own experiences in, in World War II. Um, and in their determination to kind of avoid the mistakes of World War II to, to build an alliance that was enduring. And they were determined to create uh, a post, if you will, a post-colonial, post-occupation relationship between the United States and Japan. And that really is embodied in the uh, security treaty. Uh, which, well, after all, sought to create a more equal partnership, not fully, because it's still Japan is dependent on the United States for its security, and that dependency is really fundamental to the tensions, if you will, in the relationship. But they drafted uh, that treaty under the under the leadership, obviously, of General of Ambassador MacArthur and uh, others, other people above them, and on the Japanese side as well. And the key to that was uh, to deal with the very delicate issues uh, of nuclear weapons, for one thing, um, which, uh, and this is, this is, I go through this in my book, but uh, the, there was a, a, this is, of course, a, an issue that remains all the way through, even to some sense to today, they engaged in a somewhat delicate and to some degree deceptive dance. Uh, on uh, the status of U.S. nuclear weapons in in Japan. So they are the creators of this concept of uh, what the meaning of introduction of nuclear weapons are, that you could not, the U.S. pledged not to introduce nuclear weapons into Japan. 
except that they under, had an understanding, and this was actually a very secret document that still, the text of which is still not found, but I found references to it, um, that Togo and my father created, that introduction did not mean, uh, uh, meant permanent stationing of nuclear weapons in Japan. So the idea that nuclear weapons could transit through Japan uh, and that any, and they, there's this phrase that major changes in equipment, which was meant to refer to nuclear weapons, had to be subject to prior consultation. Uh, and that was a, a the, how that phrasing was understood was a matter of dispute later on between Japan and the United States. But I think it was pretty clear at the time. Uh, and later on, American officials went out of their way to make sure the Japanese under, accepted their understanding of that. I'm going through all this to say that there was this one giant loophole in this thing. There were many loopholes, but the giant loophole was, of course, Okinawa. Because to some degree, Americans could make that agreement because Americans were interested in stationing nuclear weapons because they had control of Okinawa, complete control. Okinawa was under the literally the control of the US military. There was not even a US civilian authority there. And we were free to move nuclear weapons in and out of Okinawa without any uh, involvement of Japan. And Japanese knew this. So it, it sort of relieved the pressure on this question. And so that was the, uh, the, the reversion of Okinawa. To some degree, it came up during the revision of the treaty. But basically, the Japanese didn't press it because it allowed them to have a nuclear-free mainland Japan, mostly nuclear-free, except for the U.S. ships coming in and out with nuclear weapons on them. Um, and it, it avoided that question. But it left the reversion of Okinawa, in some sense, as the sort of last, if you will, the last phase of this process. So in some sense, you have to understand Okinawa reversion follows clearly and logically from the revision of the security treaty. It was, and, and when Prime Minister Sato came into office in 1965, he declared that that was his primary goal. He was sort of following the footsteps of his, uh, uh, his brother, um, Kishi, uh, that, you know, Kishi accomplished a revision of the security treaty. His task was to finish the job with the reversion of Okinawa. And the process really of negotiation begins then, uh, 65, 66. And my father, who had been dispatched off, he had been the Japanese country director after he was in, in Tokyo. He had been involved in all the last phases of the negotiation of security treaty. Then he went off to Pakistan for a few years. He came back and Bill Bundy was the assistant secretary of state for East Asia. And he uh, put my father back in that he was back in the job of being the country director again in Japan, but he was put in charge of something called the uh, Ryukyu Islands Working Group, which was created to try and deal with the issue of the reversion of Okinawa within the US government. And uh, my father created a kind of small team of people from Pentagon, JC, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, White House, was involved, but they weren't they weren't very active in it. Uh, and to come up with an approach, a plan for the reversion of Okinawa. My father always used to say, uh, he said it to me in May, he said there really were two Okinawa negotiations. There was a negotiation between the United States and Japan, and there was a negotiation between the civilians and the military and the US government. And the second negotiation was actually the more difficult one. So the goal of that process was to persuade the Joint Chiefs to accept giving up control of Okinawa, and they did not want to do that. Uh, this was a, uh, not only did they have their own sort of personal colony, if you will, but they had complete freedom of action. So they could move weapons in and out. They stored thousands of nuclear warheads, chemical weapons, nerve gas, all sorts of stuff on Okinawa. And starting in 65, 66, Okinawa becomes a really key, you know, logistics hub and military hub for the war in Vietnam, including 
mounting B-52 bombing missions out of Okinawa. So that process um, is really the, the, the real negotiating process on Okinawa. And in that, my father had two really important partners. I think Ambassador Reichauer was an important figure because he set the stage. He pushed very hard for, for the U.S. to face the reality of return of Okinawa with the argument that you just cited, which is the crucial argument, that without returning Okinawa, we were going to put the larger prize, if you will, the security alliance with Japan at risk. And he looked ahead, Reichauer looked ahead to the 1970 was the date for the, so there was a 10 year period for the uh, security treaty uh, had to be re, you know, re, reinstalled, if you will, reinstated. And the fear was that the rising power of the left in Japan and the issue of Okinawa reversion could actually lead to the loss of power of the LDP, of the Liberal Democratic Party. And that we had to do this for the sake of keeping in power our allies in Japan, namely Sato and the conservatives and the LDP, uh, but also to preserve the alliance. That was the trade-off. But to persuade the military to give up what they had was was a, was a really difficult task. Reichauer wasn't up to that task. He was had very bad relationship with the military. Uh, he was a pretty well known to be an opponent of the Vietnam War. Um, so his leverage was zero with the military. But then comes in Alex Johnson, who replaced Reichauer as ambassador, who was much more conservative and establishment figure who had a much better relationship with the U.S. military. And the other key figure in this was, was Morton Halpern, who had been appointed to be the Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, in the McNamara Defense Department. And he and my dad ran that Ryukyu Islands working group. And they basically ran that negotiating process. And they came close to a deal at the end of the Johnson administration, late 67, when Sato came to uh, Washington. And they they pushed all along for a non-nuclear uh, status for, for Okinawa. They understood that there was no way to return Okinawa with nuclear weapons. Uh, but they had to maneuver their way to get the Joint Chiefs uh, to accept that. And they came close. But in the end, the Joint Chiefs opposed it, and Johnson was not willing to, to challenge the Joint Chiefs and their allies in the Senate because he was in the middle of the Vietnam War. This night, late 1967, the war was fierce. Uh, and so they had to back off. And then, ironically, uh, it, Nixon gets elected in late 68. And Nixon actually had a vision. I mean, the, I, I have to say that the, the credit never should have gone to, if there is credit to go to someone, it's not, it's not to Henry Kissinger, it's to Richard Nixon. Because Richard Nixon came into office with an idea of the importance of Asia, the importance of Japan, actually, which he had some sense of having visited there. Uh, and he had his focus on the war in Vietnam. And, uh, and he had a, a, a sense that American priorities had to shift to, to Asia and the Pacific. He articulated that in a very famous prescient article he wrote in Foreign Affairs during his election campaign. So he came in actually understanding that Japan was important and Okinawa reversion had to take place. And he had that idea. And can, as- Can I, can I just pause you? Because I, I mean, yeah. I think that was a great, contrast that you make um in in what you sent me um you know nixon of course you know and and i think it um i think it's william manchester's biography of um macarthur we talk, where at one there's one point this quote has always stuck with me that the atlantic was the was the democratic ocean and the pacific was the republican ocean and the republicans often more oriented um towards the Pacific, towards Asia, and of course, you know, concerns about, you know, a lot of the concerns about the loss of China, you know, stem from that sort of, you know, traditional preoccupation with Asia and, you know, criticizing the Democrats for for overlooking that, but also just noting um, 
how much of that milieu actually the Kissinger came out of, right? Much more oriented towards Europe and the Soviet Union, much more, um, you know, Asia sort of not really figuring much in his thinking at all. And so, I, I mean, I thought that was striking and the fact that Nixon perceived that so clearly and, and actually did have um, a pretty sophisticated understanding of Japan as it was and as it could be, which... Don't, don't forget, Nixon's a Californian. Yeah. He's a Californian, not an Easterner. And uh, Kiss, no, Kissinger... Japan didn't exist for Kissinger. Actually, I think all of Asia didn't exist for Kissinger. And I'm not the only one to say that. And everybody who interacted with him knew that. Uh, he he was a complete Europeanist. And he also had this very traditional idea of power. And as you pointed out, I think, in what you wrote and what you said here today, you know, Japanese didn't have the attributes of power that he understood. They weren't a military power. And they also had a system of governance, the way the Japanese, you know, it was a, in many ways such a bureaucratized, consensus-oriented decision-making process. It was anathema to Kissinger. He was always looking for the big guy, the, 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 the leader that you connect to. Uh, and of course, he and Nixon did share one other thing, which is that they loved secrecy. They, 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 they hated the, the bureaucracy in the U.S. They hated the State Department. They were always looking for ways to go around the State Department uh, and the Defense Department to some degree. And they loved the, to find these secret channels. They, they had a penchant for that. So uh, that really shaped uh, what happened. But I, I think the irony is that Kissinger... Um, hired Mort Halpern to be on his National Security Council staff uh, before they even moved into the White House, because he had known Mort from Harvard. And Mort persuaded uh, Kissinger to hire my father as the uh, principal Asia guy on the National Security Council staff. It was a small staff in those days, not like today, with hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, and uh, my father later berated Mort for having sucked him into, into that world. But he had his own ambitions. He loved the idea of being in the center of power too. So he regretted it, but but uh, he was attracted by it as well. So when the two of these guys came in, Mort and my dad, they had the agenda they had been working on already for how to negotiate the reversion of Okinawa uh, in their head. And Kissinger wasn't thinking about it at all. In, in his memoir, Kissinger claims that he's the one who came up with the, you know, the, the first set of national security memorandums, which is, by the way, a system that Mort Halpern created, not Henry Kissinger, um, included Japan. And my father and Mort drafted the first was called NISM NSSM-5 uh, on Japan. That was in January, early in the Nixon administration, which set out the goal of Reversion of Okinawa, but that wasn't in Kissinger's mind at all. Uh, he he had no idea about this, uh, and in fact, my, my, the story really that's interesting is that my father was at a dinner that was organized for General Goodpaster before Nixon took office, and Nixon came up to my father and started talking to him about Okinawa. Uh, so he Nixon had it in his mind. Um, so. As I said, Nixon gets the credit, I think, for driving the process. Uh, Mort and my dad ran it inside the uh, White House. And the whole decision-making process that went on through the spring into the decision that was made in, uh, uh, in April, basically, to return Okinawa uh, without nuclear weapons, that, that decision was made early on inside the U.S. government. But they never told the Japanese. And uh, even though I think Mort and my dad signaled in various ways that that was where things were headed in a, in a very careful way, because they weren't allowed to say anything, um, the Japanese were never sure whether, and Sato particularly was extremely nervous about whether or not uh, he was going to get Okinawa back on terms that were politically viable within Japan. And they had a visit sort of planned for November of 1969. So they had this target 
So the maneuvering process of the negotiations was a very strange one because Kissinger, uh, Nixon, <laughs> they all agreed they would not give that concession until the end. Um, but why they didn't give that concession to the end was quite different depending on who you talk to. So for my father and Mort, and I think the principal and Alex Johnson, who was then by then the Undersecretary of State, the idea, the goal they had was to trade nuclear weapons, which weren't necessary. And they had established that they weren't necessary to be in Okinawa. They had established that with McNamara back during the Johnson administration to trade that for what they really wanted, which was to push Japan to play a larger security role in the region, and particularly to allow the ongoing use of the U.S. bases in Okinawa for regional security purposes, Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam. I mean, it's ironic because we're having the same conversations today. And in fact, you know, this leads to the famous Nixon Sato communique of 1969, which by the way, was drafted by Togo and my dad, uh, which mentions for the first time, the security of Korea and the security of Taiwan as being essential to Japan. And that was part of also a speech that Sato delivered to the National Press Club where he talks about that. And by the way, the language of that speech was actually negotiated. It wasn't a Japanese speech. It was a negotiated document. That definition of Japanese security and the, the idea of a large pushing Japan to take that larger responsibility for security in the Far East, we don't, you know, Taiwan is not mentioned in any U.S.-Japan document until for another 50 years, right. until the Biden uh, uh, meeting with Suga. So we established that principle, and it was a it was a huge accomplishment, and that was their goal, and that was the center of the negotiations. But they had to hold back the they had to use the nuclear weapons thing to some sense as leverage. That's what they were doing. However, there was another game going on, which is that Nixon wanted something else. First of all, Nixon wanted to be the one who gave the concession, and everybody understood. This was something that the president should do. It shouldn't be done by the level of negotiators of my father and Togo level, foreign minister and State Department officials. It had to be done at a leadership level. And that was fine. And they, under, they, they actually understood that and proposed that. But Nixon had another game entirely, which was <laughs> he was uh, launching his Southern strategy to rip the South from the Democratic Party and bring it into the Republican Party. And a key part of that was uh, textiles, because textile industry was really important in South Carolina, North Carolina, and the flood of Japanese textile imports was destroying the textile industry. So he was demanding that the Japanese impose what we later used to call voluntary export restraints uh, on their textile shipments to the United States. And that, that was what he wanted. So he wanted to use the nuclear issue for this purpose. And there's a whole study that was done of this by the Brookings Institute under Mort Halpern's direction, actually, later. I mean, it was a debacle in many ways, uh, because, of course, Japanese never actually carried out whatever you know vague promises they made, including the one Sato made to Nixon. But it almost blew up the negotiate these careful negotiations that went on. And that's where Kissinger got involved. So Kissinger <laughs> opened up this little secret channel. Uh, it was a backdoor channel that that is the story of which is fascinating in and of itself. The, the Sato sent this. He didn't really send him, actually. Sato approved the uh, dispatch of this envoy uh, named Wakazumi, a uh, Japanese academic who was friends with my father and other people and who had been used in the past as a kind of a a back channel, but uh, he wasn't meant to be a negotiator. Uh, but Kissinger embraced him. Oh, I, he found the secret pathway to power in Japan. Uh, and that separate parallel negotiation, which is the one that 
Kissinger claims credit for in his memoirs as having been the author of the Okinawa reversion, uh, almost actually blew up the very careful negotiations that have been going on for years, really. Uh, so it's a really interesting story of alliance management, mismanagement, but also of Kissinger's own complete lack of understanding uh, of Japan itself. I mean, he never really understood who he was dealing with uh, and what was going on. So picking up on that, because, and, and actually your mention of the Southern strategy is interesting, because sometimes when you look at Kissinger's writings, it's almost as if other countries don't have domestic politics, right? Or or that is not, essentially not a factor. And, um, you know, one thing, you know, from having read um, U.S. Embassy cable traffic from the 50s and 60s, you know, that, that foreign service officers like your father had a very nuanced understanding of Japanese politics and understood where they could push, understood where some of the uh, limitations were, obviously were alert to the politics of Okinawa and, and why this was some, sort of a ticking time bomb for the relationship. And you know, maybe that's not everything, but clearly if you want to understand and, and understand what you can get from Japan as an, as an alliance partner, that you have to have that there. And that seems almost completely opposite, you know, that, you know, and, and I pointed this out in the note I wrote, you know, that, that Kissinger falls back on these, these cliches about, you know, the, you know, inscrutable Japanese and you can't understand how they make decisions. And it just seems like, well, no, it takes work, but you can understand how the Japanese political system works and the interests of Japanese decision makers. And, and there didn't seem to be any interest in doing that on, on Kissinger's part. Now, Kissinger uh, saw all that as sort of clientitis problems, you know, that uh, uh, and that that wasn't just about Japan. I remember my father was ambassador to Korea. The same kind of tensions existed. You know, alliance managers, that is their role. Their role is to find solutions that, you know, reflect not only our interests, which are always primary, but to some degree, the interests of our of our allies. That's and that's not always easy to do. Uh, I, I'm afraid that that type of skills of alliance management are less less than uh, present these days than they used to be, and maybe also because the the people who used to be empowered to do this kind of thing are no longer empowered to do that. I mean, uh, we've we've really uh, collapsed the decision making process to some degree. To very everything gets done at the top, but. Uh, I think that was always the argument. Uh, and of course, it's an argument that leaves you open to the charge that you're 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 lawyering on the part of your uh, of your client, the ally. But the always the argument was we had to do some, this in a way that would allow the Japanese to feel like they had their own agency here. Uh, I mean, either you have alliance means not only that, you know, your partners, but it means that you understand that your ally has some equal share in, in, in how policy gets formulated. Often, of course, it's an unequal alliance, an unbalanced alliance between the United States and Japan. And that creates the tension that's there. The Japanese always wavering back and forth between the fear of abandonment and the fear of entanglement, being drawn into conflicts they don't want to be involved in. And you can see that playing out today. I mean, look at the U.S.-China policy. I mean, I'm watching our allies, Japan and Korea, trying to figure out how to <laughs> maneuver between uh, China, with whom they have deep engagement in, on many levels, and the United States, uh, who, on whom they are completely dependent for their security. Uh, and th this tension is, has been going on for a long time. That's why I think it's important. I've sort of worked on this book partly with the idea that the understanding alliance management is actually one of the most important things, you know, that we really almost always fail to do. We we really focused on adversarial relationships. How do we uh, deal with a foe? But we don't really look that intensely on the managing alliances. And of course, only I think probably because of Donald Trump's assault on our alliances and you know we've had kind of a reinvigorated appreciation for the for alliance management under the Biden administration. I think they've done a pretty good job actually uh, in this respect. But still, I think it's a a skill set that's kind of atrophied uh, 
in our foreign policy. So with the time we have left, I just wanted to ask also, so your father was on the National Security Council staff for, I believe, was it two years um, and did not- Not two years. Not two years. No, my father was the first person to leave the National Security Council staff. Uh, Kissinger famously, in an interaction with a friend, said, called him the first defector. Uh, no, he fled the National Security Council staff in, 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 in July, I mean, within seven months. And then he was followed by many others. Uh, and he was one of the people that was wiretapped by uh, the White House and Henry Kissinger and the FBI in their search for leaks. It's a famous case that only emerged out into the open and after Watergate. Um, and it, but my father was when he understood what happened was quite bitter about it. But he he really couldn't live in that environment of paranoia and secrecy uh, for very long. I mean, he he was a uh, a diplomat and a negotiator. He wasn't a uh, he wasn't built for the for for that world. And uh, I think he 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 went then to Japan where he finished the negotiations on Okinawa, including the negotiations of the actual treaty, which was finally signed in 1971 and that led to the formal reversion in 1972. I think I was thinking of, of the that latter part where, where he went to Japan, but but certainly did not leave the National Security Council on um, on, on the most favorable of terms. And, you, and as you said, he um, when you look at... Um, Seymour Hersh's book about Kissinger from the early 80s, that your father's name shows up a lot um, in that book. Uh, I think my father kept secrets pretty well. He was a well-trained Foreign Service officer, uh, and he only talked about all this after he retired from the Foreign Service. And, and certainly one of the people he talked to was, was Seymour Hersh. And uh, there's a lot of my father in that book. And um, I do recall seeing the two of them talking together in the living room and they were, my parents' apartment in New York, uh, you know, he unloaded a little bit. Um, and uh, Kissinger, you know, uh, for Kissinger, loyalty was everything. Uh, that was the first thing he demanded, was personal loyalty. And so my father broke that bond uh, and had to live with a kind of difficult relationship with Kissinger for many years. Kissinger was Secretary of State. My father was really loyal to the Foreign Service and to the State Department. Uh, and Kissinger was constantly putting him in a position of saying, who, you know, you got to choose me or the State Department. And he used, because he was the senior State Department official in the National Security Council, he constantly tried to use him as a point man against the State Department. And my father was really uncomfortable with that, uh, with that role. And uh, he, he paid a personal price for it in his career path. But Anyway, uh, he was very proud, and I think all the people, Mort Halperin and Alex Johnson and everybody else who was involved, felt that the reversion of Okinawa was uh, one of the great triumphs of American diplomacy. Um, we gave back uh, a strategic colony, if you will, for the purposes of preserving and deepening an alliance, an alliance which endures to this day. And I think it, it sits on that foundation of the security treaty revision and Okinawa reversion. Those remain the two underpinnings of our alliance to this day. And that's, a, that's a, I think, was a, a great achievement. Well, not I, Henry Kissinger's I, achievement, however. That's, yeah, the important note that this was not a Kissinger achievement. It's a great note to end on. And Dan, I certainly look forward to seeing the final version of the book. Uh, Me thank too. You, <laughs> thank you. I hope, good luck finishing that. And thank you for carving a little time out of your day to to talk about some of this stuff. I really, uh, really appreciate your pleasure. Time. I apologize for going on and on. But <laughs> thank, thank you. Take care.